Gresham College presents Rotation in Space by Professor Carolyn Crawford. So today's talk is about rotation in space and the reason I've picked up on this as a topic is rotation and spin is ubiquitous in space. You see stars and planets, black holes, even galaxies all spinning. And this is just an idea I want to develop because you have all kinds of questions like why do some things rotate and not others? How can you tell things are spinning and rotating, especially when they're light years away from you? What can we learn from the spin, from the rotation, about the history of the objects or things that may have happened to them or about the evidence for other matter out there? And so those are the kind of ideas I'm going to develop and talk about in the context of things from our solar system right out to huge spiral galaxies. And there are going to be two phrases or two types of rotational motion I'm going to mention in this talk. And we tend to describe them both as rotation. Strictly, there is rotation, which is when one body spins around on an axis. So, for example, that would be the spin of the Earth round on its vertical axis. That's rotation. If you want to talk about the spin of one body round another in an orbit, that is strictly called revolution. And those are what the two words mean. I don't promise that I will remember that through the talk, but so we're going to be considering both those motions. Something spinning on its own and something rotating round another bo body with that body at the centre. So, if we're going to talk about spin and rotation. The first thing to ask is why do some objects spin and not others? In fact, why is anything in the whole universe rotating? And to explore that, we're really going to have to address an issue of physics. I'm going to have to introduce you to a concept called angular momentum, or if you like, rotational momentum. And it's something we're all familiar with in everyday life, even from when you're a child on the sort of merry-go-round or the sort of spin thing on the playground. It's something we encounter, but actually to try and get across its importance and why it dictates the rate at which things spin and the direction they spin, I have to simplify it a little bit. So this is what we call a conserved quantity. If something is spinning, it has angular momentum, and that means that it stays with that amount of angular momentum for the rest of its life, unless it has an external force, an external twist applied to it. And that's the only way you can change the angular momentum of an object. And not just is it the amount of, amount of angular momentum, direction is also important. Anybody who's played with a gyroscope knows that you can set it spinning about an axis. And then if you push that axis over, like in this movie here, it will then process, it'll move around, because it's keeping the same amount of angular momentum conserved about the vertical axis. So if you like, think of angular momentum as you know, how much oomph something has as it rotates. Strictly, it's a vector quantity. I mean, we could talk about vectors and cross products and things. That means you've got to subscribe not just the, how much angular momentum there is, but what direction it moves in. These things are important. But a very gross simplification that will suffice for what we need today is to describe it as the product or the, the quantity that you get by multiplying the mass with the rotational rate of the body and the radius squared, its size squared, all of that has to be conserved about an axis. And you know, that means, for example, for something of a given mass, of a given angular momentum, if you increase the radius, if you increase the size, then its spin slows down. If you decrease the radius, if you make it smaller, then it's going to spin up. And there are a couple of little examples I've got if my computer will load the videos. So the example of the latter one, if the radius shrinks in, then the rotational rate must increase, is, of course, the ice skater. Here's a, a fabulous lady doing spins. Watch how she skates along, and then she brings her arms in, and she speeds up to phenomenal spin rates. And this is just the conservation of angular momentum again. I bet she feels dizzy after that. And then the opposite. Well, we're looking at a somersaulting diver. 
And it's only a short clip, but what you have to notice is he does two and a half somersaults before he dives into the water. And he doesn't have very far to go. And obviously, he springs up from the board, but he tucks himself into a very tight ball in order to accomplish the number of somersaults. And then just before he splashes into the water, he opens out and he completely slows himself down and he has this graceful entrance into the water. So just watch him do that. So just play that again because it was quite quick. But you can see the effect of speeding up and then slowing out just from that very graceful entrance into the water. Okay, well, yeah, we can see it in terms of ice skaters. We can see it in terms of divers, some sorting divers. How does this reflect on astronomy? Well, what you have to realise is that everything collapses down under gravity. And the key word there is collapse. So whether it's a spiral galaxy from an enormous cloud of gas or whether... It's a planetary system and a star collapsing around a small molecular cloud, for example, something like this. There is a decrease in size inherent in the process. So, for example, here we have a molecular cloud of gas and dust sitting out there in the interstellar medium. It could be maybe a few light years long, so that's a few tens of trillions of kilometres that is eventually going to collapse down and form stars from it that may be about a million kilometres across, maybe a couple of million kilometres across if they're large. So there's a huge decrease in size. That means that if this cloud has got the tiniest bit of spin on it, that spin is just going to get faster and faster as the object shrinks. And how does a cloud like this get spin to begin with? Well, imagine it's floating out there in space. It's full of molecules, it's full of gas, it's full of dust. And maybe there's a neighbouring cloud or a star, and that just has a gravity that tugs slightly on one side of the cloud relative to the other. It just gives it the tiniest rotational motion. It doesn't have to have much, but as it then collapses down into gravity and gets smaller and smaller, it's only going to speed up. And the things that form from a cloud like this, as I say, whether it's a whole spiral galaxy or whether it's an individual star, are going to be spinning phenomenally fast in some cases. So it's from a cloud like this that we think our sun formed, and our sun is spinning. So it, has, it spins about an axis that isn't quite vertical. It's about sort of seven degrees away from vertical, and it spins with what's known as differential rotation. Those of you who came and heard about Saturn knows that the gas giants do this as well. It's, the sun is made of gas. It's a star. It doesn't rotate as a solid body like the Earth does but different parts of the sun rotate at different rates. So the centre of the sun here takes about 26 days to go once around. At higher latitudes, it takes longer because it's spinning slower, and then right by the polar regions, it takes 10 days longer to make one, revolu one rotation around the axis. And the question is, how do we know this? Well, the most obvious thing to do is to measure objects on the surface. This doesn't give you the exact rotation rate of the sun because how long the sun takes to go once round is slightly different from us looking at the sun and seeing how long it takes the same feature to rotate round to in front of us because we have moved on in our orbit a bit. You know, we, we're observing from a moving platform of the Earth. I'll get back to that in a minute because that's quite important. But the best thing we can do is look at a feature on the sun and see how long it takes to rotate back into view in the same part of the sun. And this is one of the things that Galileo did right back in the summer of 1612. He observed these dark structures on the sun known as sunspot. These are his drawings, different days, and he's tracking the progression of these features across the disk. Now, sunspots are dark regions on the sun because they're cold. Well, cold, they're about 1,500 degrees cooler than the rest of the disk. And they're enormous structures. They're thousands of kilometres across. You know, they're comparable to the size of the Earth, and they're dark. And they last for maybe a few weeks, a few months, and they tend to be very common when the sun is very active. We use them as traces of the internal activity of the sun. However, they also track this rotation rate of the sun. And so even in 1612, from being the first person to project the image of the sun with this telescope, Galileo could, take, could measure that the sun's rotation was approximately four weeks once round. Of course, now we don't just look at features on the surface of the sun to track its rotation. We also use helioseismology. Again, if you go back, if you were here for my talk on the sounds of the universe, this is how sound waves travel through the sun and set it oscillating and vibrating. 
we can use that to study the internal structure of the sun. What we find is the center of the sun, actually, so where the energy is produced and then the zone just above it, that rotates much more like a sort of solid body. And it's just the top layers of the sun that are all moving at slightly different rates. So even understanding the rotation of our sun is, you know, the nearest star to us is not a trivial matter. But the sun is just a star and it's even harder to work out how other stars are rotating. Now, even with a big telescope, nearly all the stars just appear as points of light. Now, other stars are magnetically active. They produce star spots in the same way our sun produces sunspots. But these are much more difficult to detect. You can't actually resolve the disk and see them moving across the surface of the disk. We can guess, we can infer by looking... I mean, if it's got a star spot on, it's dims the light of the star by a tiny amount, just because it's slightly darker, it's slightly cooler. If it's a large star spot, that can affect the brightness of the star. And so we can monitor the brightness of stars and look for you know, this kind of dimming that indicates a star spot is travelling across the disk of the star periodically. And that could be one way to determine the rotation rate. Of course, that isn't the only way that you can get this periodic dimming of stars. Maybe there's a planet around the star moving between you and it. Maybe the star is a bit active and its brightness is varying all the time. So there are complications to that method. The better way of doing it is looking at the effect of rotation of a star on the spectrum of the light it produces. And this is very easily done. So to explain, if you have a star that you see pole on, so it's rotating like this, all the light is that you get from this star contributes to give what we call a spectrum. This is just the colours of the light that it produces. And within that spectrum, you have what we call absorption lines. These are where molecules, or not really molecules, but atoms in the outer layers of the star absorb the light from the inner part of the star and they sort of select out different colours, different energies of light, and you get these characteristic structures. This is what we analyse with our telescope, the spectrum rather than the image of the star. So if you have a star that then is rotating, here is one that's rotating about a vertical axis in this direction, you can see that the, this side of the star is coming towards you, this side of the star is going away from you. We can detect that in its light from using the Doppler shift on the light. So, for example, if we've got a feature like one of these absorption lines, and this is just a cut, so if you like, you're plotting colour along this way, a wavelength along this way, and where there's a dip, it shows there's an absence of light, and then it climbs back up again. When you have this limb of the star here, this is, its light is slightly blue shifted, so this dip appears ever so much to the blue of the main structure, which comes from the bulk of the star. On the other side, the light is red shifted because it's moving away. And the same feature is just moved slightly to the red. And you've still got the light from the bulk of the star in the middle. And so the combined effect is that the whole of that line, instead of being very narrow and sharp, it's smeared out by the rotation of the star. And you get a much broader feature than you would if you saw the star pole on. And this enables you to measure quite precisely the structure and the rotational structure of a star. And you can look at different components of light right up from the poles, right round the equator. And we find that stars out there, you know, they're all spinning, everyone we look at, where obviously it's got the right orientation towards us. For example, this is the star Regulus, the brightest star in, Le in the constellation of Leo. This is one of the fastest rotating stars we know about. It takes only 16 hours, so you're talking about something the size of the sun, 16 hours to go once round on its axis, and it's rotating so fast that it really is bulging. It's not a nice spherical star. The centre is travelling so much faster than the outer layers. There's a difference of about 30% in size between pole to pole than across the equator. It's a very squashed, flat star. So a star forms from one of these molecular clouds and it forms and spin, it forms right at the core and it spins up because it's collapsing down into gravity. And the way this works is that you don't just get the material in the, uh, in the cloud that forms a star, there are also knock-on effects in that 
some of the materials left over, and that's what eventually goes on to form a planetary system around the star. But something very interesting happens to that in the collapse. And we see planetary systems in formation, so long before they come anything resembling planets, deep in several of the nebulae around our vicinity in the Milky Way. So here, for example, these are fragments of molecular cloud that are getting very compact. You can tell they're getting denser because they're getting darker. These are what are going to collapse down and form stars. And the next stage of what happens to these, you can see in this wonderful nebula. It's the, you can see it in the sky at night at the minute. It's a great nebula of Orion. If we just look in a region around here, and you really need to zoom in to start to see individual stars because it's just in there. You can see there's a young star, and it's surrounded by a sort of dark disk. That's what we know as a proplid. There are a couple more here, or protoplanetary disk. And what we think is happening is this. You have your cloud of gas and dust, this molecular cloud. Matter rains into the center. You just need a slight over, you know, a slight over density in the matter. It has slightly more gravity, self-gravity. It pulls in material from the surrounding cloud. It gets more massive, gets more gravity, pulls in more material. You get a runaway process as soon as the collapse starts. The thing that happens is as material falls under gravity, it heats up. And the centre of the cloud gets hotter and hotter until it reaches some point to like 15 million degrees or so where nuclear fusion is ignited and at that point it becomes a protostar. It still takes it a while to get a balance between how much energy it needs to produce to prevent gravity. It's unstable for a while. So long before it settles down to become a young star, it kind of goes through this unstable period called a protostar. But at that point, it's producing enough energy in the centre that it stops matter accumulating onto the core of the star. And it hasn't used all the material in the cloud. So at this point, after a few hundred million years, you have a protostar at the centre, but you have all the remnants of the material in the cloud still around the protostar. And that's the prop proplid, or protoplanetary disk. And it's spinning. Again, it's collapsed down. It's formed from the cl cloud. We'll talk about why it forms a disk in a bit. But it's actually spinning. And eventually, that will go on and form planetary systems, something like our own. And we see these disks, these spinning disks, around many of the stars in the Orion Nebula, for example, about half of the newly forming stars there. I mean, this is just an artist's impression, but it gives you the sort of concept of what it is that we're looking at. Protostar in the center dusty torus of material around the outside. So when you see, I mean, we, we see ones that are very obviously like that, but there are some that are much more misshapen because you've got outside influences. But left in to its own devices, any spinning cloud of particles will settle down into a disk. And that's to do with collisions. So if you have a big Tory dust disk, now within that dusty disk, you've got material aggregating to form tiny chunks of rock that then aggregate to form planetesimals that eventually go on and form the planets. But in the process, there are lots of particles in a big cloud. They're all in random orbits. Say they start off with random orbits, some very much tilted, some at different angles to each other, as represented here, about this cloud of ob objects around, say, the sun. The only thing we specify, because they've collapsed down from a cloud that might have had a tiny bit of rotation, there is a net sense of rotation about them. There is a propensity for more of the particles to be rotating one way versus the other. And as the cloud shrinks and the, the torus shrinks, it begins to get denser, which means those particles undergo more and more collisions. And collisions again, conserve something about the properties of the particles, and they act to average out the velocities. So, for example, if we had most of the particles are traveling around in this direction, and we've got one that's just unusually going the other direction, if it meets, it is, every collision it makes will be like a head-on smash. It'll be a violent collision, and that'll act to either push it back around the way the rest of the particles are going, or it'll act to turn it round or completely pulverise it into bits. And so any particles that are going the wrong way round soon rapidly get brought to their senses, as it were. They get, um, they get brought into the fold. 
And as far as the rest of the particles concerned, they're all at different angles to each other, but there's this net sense that they're going this way round rather than this way round. And so what happens when two of these particles, say we take the red and the blue, and let's just zoom in, as they collide, the collision acts to average out their velocities. Now, they're both going forward, but they have very different velocities, directions going up and down. So what happens is as they collide, they average out the vertical velocities. The rotational velocity is kept because they're both going the same direction. That sense gets kept. But after many of these collisions, all of those vertical motions totally get flattened out, get averaged out, because some are above, some are below, and you're left with just the rotational motion. And very soon, everything settles down into a flattened pancake. And we see this kind of structure everywhere. I would just say, if you have got one renegade, one that really doesn't, you know, still persists on remaining on a tilted orbit, orbit it doesn't last long because even if most of them flatten down and then you've got just one that goes still at an angle that means every time it goes around in its orbit it passes through the cloud of other objects this disk and so it's got two potential collision sites on every orbit and so even one that's left over even more rapidly gets brought down and into this flat disk and that's why when you see spinning systems, they are flat. So whether it's the proplids I've just mentioned, whether it's the rings of Saturn, the remains of a shattered moon some 100 million years ago around Saturn, again, an ensemble of particles with a net sense of rotation, uh, whether it's um, a big spiral galaxy that's collapsed down from a cloud of, of hot gas. All, anything that's rotating naturally has this flattened um, shape. So when we go back to the proplids, many of them, you can see there are some that look much as we expect. There's one here, one here. You're seeing a disk edge on. Some of them are much more distorted because they're being blasted by winds from stars. They're getting externally shaped into sort of much more kind of jellyfish. But you can still see a disk surrounding the star right in the centre. So if our planetary system forms from a system like this that's rotating and the planets form in that disk, it is totally understandable that the thing that results all behaves such that all the planets rotate or revolve around the sun in the same direction as each other, and that that is the same direction as the sun spins on its axis, it's the same direction as the planets spin on their axis, and even those with giant moons it's the same sense that those moons spin around the planet. We've all collapsed down from the same rotating cloud, and we've all sharing that sense of rotation. And so, again, that's obviously why everything is in this flattened plane that's collapsed from this torus. Well, of course, that's a theory. You will know that there are always exceptions, but the exceptions tell you something interesting about the history of the object. So, for example, Uranus isn't rotating like a top, but it's more barreling along like a bowling ball. It's had its axis of rotation knocked over by 90 degrees. We think perhaps by this means that it suffered a huge collision early on in its history. Maybe it collided with another planetesimal, and that's knocked it over. And so it's telling us something about the history of formation of Uranus. There's also Venus. Venus is a complete renegade. It rotates the wrong way very slowly. So it's what we call retrograde motion. It's going the same way around the sun, but it's just then spinning backwards. Or you could consider it spinning the right way, but just upside down. Same thing. But what happens again is, why is Venus different? Well, does this mean it had a giant collision in its past? Maybe this, maybe there was, a, it formed relatively late on, and there was some major collision involved. Why didn't that create a moon around Venus? If it did create a moon, what happened to it? It starts to tell us something very interesting. There are lots of different theories about why Venus happens to behave the wrong way. Some of them involve sort of cumulative gravity between the Earth and the Sun, perhaps slowing down the rotation. So it could have been flipped or it could have been slowed. And also within the individual moon systems, again, when we talk about Saturn, all the moons behave follow the line of the rings above the Saturn's equator. The furthermost moon, Phoebe, is going the wrong way round. So if all the moons are going that way round, it's going that way round. 
and at a huge angle. That immediately tells you it wasn't formed from the same system that formed from the others. It is a, it's a captured asteroid. It's an interloper. And the orbital dynamics are what reveal that. Asteroids, of course, they form the belt. You see why? They tend to all be going around the sun in the same direction. But they have, of course, all suffered collisions. You just need to look at the, the shape of Eros here. It's about 30 kilometers long, about 10 kilometers wide. It's got craters all over it. It's gone through lots of collisions. And you know these are not nice spherical bodies. So when you look at the way they rotate, they tumble. They're chaotic. And that's because any individual rotational motion has just got bashed out of them with all these collisions that they've suffered in that very crowded environment. But nonetheless, everything is settled down into this thick torus belt, the asteroid belt. And then it gets even more complicated when you go to planets around other stars. Now, these are obviously artists' um, impressions of planets that move between us and their star. They've been discovered with the, the WASP telescope by um, UK Europe Consortium. And they discovered a whole host of these where the planet orbits the wrong way compared... So the sun's rotating that way, and instead of the planet moving that way, as you might expect, it's moving the other way. And this is not uncommon amongst exoplanets, planets around other stars. And this tells us that maybe these have formed slightly differently from our own solar system. These are all giant planets, you know, several times the mass and size of Jupiter. We think that these have to form right at the outside of the Taurus to be gas giants, and that they slowly migrate in once they form through sort of interactions, gravitational interactions with the rest of the material of the disk, so they're then a close orbit. The fact that these are going the wrong way around suggests that early on, when they're still right at the outskirts of the, their planetary system, when they're forming, they've had some tugs maybe from neighboring, neighboring stars, close companions or something, that have slowed down that and have pulled them back around the wrong way and then they've spiraled in and lost energy to go much close to their star. So even though our solar system mostly makes sense, when you look at other solar systems, they tend to behave quite differently. And just a comment, you might I say this is art impression. Again, these are just stars where we see them as points of light. How do we know that a planet is rotating differently to the way the star's turning? Okay, that's quite a subtle observation if you think of it. We have to go back to this idea of looking at the light from the star, and especially that absorption light in its spectrum. Imagine you have your rotating galaxy, and I showed you how... Galaxy? Star? Rotating star, and its, emission li its absorption line is all smeared out because you've got the blue shift and you've got the red shift. What happens, if you have a planet moving across the star, it'll block out first the blue limb, of the star, it'll block out this blue wing here, so you don't have that adding to the profile. Later on, it'll block out the red wing, okay? And that means you won't have the broadening of the absorption line here at this side. And so by looking at which way the shape of the absorption line deforms or deviates as the planet moves across the disk, you can work out whether you, you, you lose the, the blue wing first or the red wing first to know which way across the planet is rotating and how that revolving and how that compares to the star's rotation. So it's quite clever stuff. And there are other consequences for planetary orbits in our solar system. The first law of Kepler's rules of planetary motion is that the, the planets rotate around the sun, but not in circular orbits. I mean, they're not quite as elliptical as I've shown here, but in sort of slightly squashed circles with the sun at one focus. And this has consequences in terms of the angular momentum because it also means that some points in this orbit, the Earth is further away, so at a larger distance from the sun than at other points. And so that's gonna have consequences for its speed. So, for example, if we look at the motion of the Earth around the Sun in this movie, when it's further away, to retain the same amount of angular momentum, it slows down. When it gets closer, the radius decreases, it speeds up. And so we have different speeds in our orbit around the Sun because of this elliptical um, orbit that we follow. And this does have consequences for how we perceive time and positions of the Sun on Earth. We're always led to think that the Sun is overhead at midday. So if we look up at the sun, that it's overhead at midday, the sun and the earth rotates once and then it's overhead at midday again. The fact that we move around in the orbit means that's not quite true. The sun is actually only overhead at midday four times a year. 
Okay, there's a mismatch, and it's called the equation of time. And it's caused because this idea of us being on a moving platform again. So, for example, the sun is overhead here. In the meanwhile, we rotate once round on our axis. While we're doing that, we move a little way, just a tiny amount, obviously not to scale, by the way, move a tiny way along our orbit. And that means by the time the Earth has rotated once, the sun is not quite overhead. In fact, we have to rotate just a little bit more to bring the sun back to overhead. So you have this mismatch between what the sun says and what the clocks say. And it is exacerbated around the winter solstice. Now, some of you may have mentioned it and may have noticed this. You're a very astute audience. Around the winter solstice, what happens is just before you get the sunsets start getting later before you've had the latest sunrise. This means effectively that it's, it, you get the shortest afternoon, two or three weeks, before you get the shortest morning. And that's because at that point at winter, the Earth is closest in its orbit around the sun. It's moving fastest, according to those laws of uh, planetary motion. It's moved further along this orbit, and so the Earth has had to rotate quite, you know, the most to bring the sun back overhead. So it's around the time of the winter solstice that the, there's this mismatch between the sort of sundial time and real time, and the day is most asymmetric about noon, about midday. So that's, you know, obviously that's a kind of subtle effect on Earth. As soon as you get to somewhere like Mercury, you've got big problems. Mercury is the closest planet into the sun. It rotates once on its axis every 58 Earth days. It goes once round the sun every 88 days. So you might think if it rotates once on its axis, one Mercury day is 58 Earth days. No, one Mercury day is technically um, two of its years. And that's because, <laughs> okay, you, have to, you have to keep your wits about you with this, right? So here we have day one, sun is overhead on Mercury, okay? Now, in the time that Mercury is spinning round, after 44 days, you're reaching sunset. But after 58 days, Mercury has gone once round on its axis. But it's only two-thirds of its orbit away around the sun, which means even though it's gone round once on its axis, that direction is now staring out into darkness. The sun's in the wrong direction. By the time Mercury's gone once round the sun... It's done one and a half revolutions, and you've got midnight now overhead. It's then got to continue round and continue round, and then by the time you get uh, two full rotations of Mercury, again, you're just getting close to sunrise, and you've got to go through all one long morning right round to day 88, and you're finally facing sorry, day, day 88 of the second revolution before the sun is overhead. So despite Mercury taking 58 Earth days to go once around its axis and 88 Earth days to go around its orbit, its day from one noon to the next is actually, well, it's gone three rotations and two revolutions in the meanwhile. So it must be very, very confusing on Mercury. The days last an awfully long time and the nights last an awfully long time. Okay, so that you can have great fun with all this sort of rotational stuff and orbits within the solar system. But of course, there are many more things in space that are rotating. And again, it's this sense of collapse down, shrinking down, things spin up. So, for example, if you have a very massive star, one, you know, 20, 25 times the mass of our sun, when it runs out of fuel at the end of its life, it shucks off the outer layers in what's known as a supernova explosion. The outer layers get blasted away into space. The center is no longer producing so much energy at the core. It collapses down into gravity, and it shrinks, and therefore it speeds up. So you have something maybe that's larger than the size of our sun, a few million kilometers across, shrinking down to something the size that's, say, about 10 kilometers, about the size of the city of London. And again, we talked about how fast neutron stars are spinning. Some of them produce huge beams of radiation along their axes, and these sweep round every time it does one rotation. And we can detect the radio signal. Again, I played it in the last lecture about the sounds of the universe, where we can see these objects 10 kilometers across, spinning at between, say, once every second, up to over 700 times a second. 
And again, that huge spin rate is just caused by collapse of a star spinning to rate like our sun that collapses through phenomenal amounts and spins up incredibly fast. And so again, it's just this conservation of angular momentum that's producing those really high spin rates. It's also true if you have a much bigger star, one that's you know, over 25 times the mass of our sun, when in the centre collapses under gravity, it goes through that neutron star phase and it can't withstand gravity there, it collapses on to form a black hole. And black holes are also spinning. There are very few ways we can categorise a black hole. We can measure its mass, theoretically we can sort of estimate a size for it, but in terms of observables we can only really get a sense of both its mass and the rate at which it spins. The mass is, you know, brings stuff into orbit around it and we can measure, if you're in orbit, so like the Earth orbiting around the Sun, how fast you orbit depends on the mass of the Sun and how far you're out. That dictates how fast we go around the Sun. It's the same for material in orbit around a black hole. If you've got the black hole and you see stuff in orbit around it, you can work out from how far away it is from the centre and how fast it's moving, the mass of the object at the core. And so black holes, we can work out their mass from the observations of stuff spinning around them. The actual spin of the black hole itself is very tricky. This is something that's uh, really cutting-edge astrophysics. Again, artist impression, by the way. Because if you've got a black hole in isolation, you can't really tell much about it. But imagine a black hole that's formed out of a star that was in a binary system with another star. At some point, maybe when this... Uh, the other star swells up and becomes a red giant or something, it's able to pull material from that star onto the black hole. And it's by observing how this material falls onto the black hole that we can begin to tell something about the spin. In particular, the theory suggests there is one last stable orbit before material is accumulated by the, the black hole. Stuff just before it's... It, it's accumulated by the black hole, it's very hot. We observe that in X-ray light. From X-ray light, again, I'll be talking about astro X-ray astrophysics at another, another lecture, so I'll keep... I'm not going to tell you everything now. But suffice to say, it's only now, in the last couple of years, we've begun to use X-ray X-ray astronomy of material falling right, observation of material falling right, just before it's accumulated by a black hole. The last stable orbit, the size of that depends on how fast the black hole is spinning and we're beginning to get measurements of the phenomenal spin rates of these black holes. And matter, when it falls onto a black hole, it doesn't just go crump onto there. We have a problem in that we form what's called an accretion disk. Matter just doesn't fall straight onto the black hole. It has to go through this intervening period, and it has to do that because it has to lose its angular momentum. So wherever we see material falling onto a black hole or a neutron star, any kind of compact object, it forms a flat accretion disk, a flat disk around the compact object. Again, here's another artist's impression. Deep in the centre here, there's a black hole, invisible, and all the material that's been accumulated onto it is kind of, it's almost like whirling down the vortex, right, down the plug hole. It's all spinning very fast. And this is necessary because material falling onto the black hole, it's rotating, it has angular momentum. You have to lose that angular momentum before you can get accreted by the object at the centre. And the accretion disk is how this is done. Imagine you've got an infinite disk. I mean, obviously it's a disk because there are collisions and it settles down into that flat system. You have a rotating system. Imagine you've got two shells within this accretion disk. I mean, obviously it doesn't have nice shells and rings. It's just, we're just taking two parts of the accretion disk, considering them as different rings. The inner bit is rotating faster than the outer bit. But because they're actually in contact with each other, there's some sort of sticky viscosity. There's some sticking just along the edge here. And what that does is that because this is moving slower, it gets sped up a bit by the inner ring of material that's moving faster. And similarly, the outer ring, sorry, the inner ring gets slowed down a bit by the material in the outer ring, and so their speeds change. This means that their angular momentum changes. Remember, angular momentum is conserved, but it's conserved across the whole accretion disk. So this inner ring, if it's got the same mass, it's got the same radius, but its rotational rate has decreased, it has lost angular momentum. 
The outer ring has got the same mass, same angular momentum. Its rotational rate has increased. It has gained angular momentum. And so all this happened is the angular momentum's just got distributed further out. And of course, there aren't just two shells in any accretion disk. There's a whole series of shells. And the net effect is material right at the center of the accretion disk loses its angular momentum. It's able to fall on to the compact object, get accreted. And the accretion disk kind of expands. And there's this tail of material very far out that's carrying more or less all the angular momentum from all the rest of the material that has since got accumulated by the disk. And accretion disks are endemic throughout astronomy. Wherever you see accretion processes, it always happens by its accretion disk. And this is what is so important in terms of observing things like neutron stars and black holes, especially black holes where you can't see material once it's passed over the event horizon. However, the fact that you have a glowing accretion disk of material sitting there, you can observe its rotation rate, you can observe its properties, and you can determine something about the black hole at the core just by seeing how it influences that accretion disk. So this is caused because of the rotational motion. However, it's also very useful then as a diagnostic of what's going in right at the center. You can't actually resolve the accretion disk, though. It's still tiny. Even around a giant supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy, the accretion disk is still tiny. We can analyze the light from it. We can work out all the motions. We can't actually image it. But what is interesting that in many of the galaxies where you look much, much further out than the accretion disk. So for example, here's a large elliptical galaxy. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of right in the core. The accretion disk and the active black hole are sort of probably about the size of my fingernail, are much, much smaller. They're buried within this bright source of light. But nonetheless, that rotational motion, that disk, extends much, much further out to much larger radii. And in several of these objects, we also see dusty toruses sort of extending that uh, direction and that rotationality of you know, what's going on around the accretion disk. You see them also much further out, again, all around the central object. And you can measure the rotation of these. This is... M87 is our nearest, where, well, you know, near is relative in terms of astronomy. It's still, I don't know how many tens of millions of light years away. But it's one of our nearest giant elliptical galaxies. It's got an active supermassive black hole at its core. We can't resolve the accretion disk. But what we do see is a disk of warm ionized gas rotating around that hole. And in the same way, as I said, you know, how fast the planet moves around the sun depends on the mass of the sun and how far away you are. How fast this disk material is rotating tells you what kind of mass it's orbiting. So, for example, when you look at the light from one side of the disk to the other, in the same way as we saw the difference in the sh shift of the light between blue and red of a star rotating, you have some gas that's moving away from you, some that's gas that's coming towards you. It's a systemic motion, meaning there's rotation like this. And from the speeds of rotation, could be somewhere between 500 to 1,000 kilometers per second, and how far away that gas at is out from the center, we can deduce there's a supermassive black hole, and we can weigh it as being about 9 billion times the mass of our sun, just from observations, again, of the rotation of objects. And then, if we just finally move on to the biggest things that spin, are uh, the spiral galaxies. And this is the same sense of spin that we get from a collapsing gas cloud. In this case, it's a hot halo of gas. You've got the slightest tug on it, it flattens down into that pancake shape as time moves on. If you look at a spiral galaxy like this, at the centre it has a sort of small ball-shaped um, structure of old stars. They're old stars because they're very white, yellow stars. Those are the ones that form very early on. The more recently formed stars are the blue stars, and they are always in this flat disk. And so these are the stars that form later. And it gives you an idea that the centre forms first, and then the disk forms sort of slightly later on. And then all subsequent star formation takes place in this big invisible disk of gas that's rotating around the centre and has settled down that way after the central structure formed. And the whole of the galaxy is rotating. So here's a galaxy like ours a spiral galaxy. 
Now, these are not the most common galaxies. Most galaxies are the ball-shaped elliptical galaxies. When they form, there was no net rotation around their original cloud. They collapse in a fairly sort of isotropic manner, the same from all directions. They form a nice round ball shape. Slightest bit of spin on that cloud, you end up with the spiral galaxies. And so just, again, the rotation has severe consequences for the actual shape and structure of the galaxy that was formed. Now, our galaxy is rotating in space. We live about halfway from the center out to the edge of one of the spiral arms like this. You are moving around the galaxy at the order of um, 220 kilometers per second. Okay? You're moving very fast. In fact, you know, it's worth just saying that you are all moving phenomenally fast, all due to rotation. So the Earth is spinning, so you're probably rotating due just to the surface of the Earth going around at sort of probably about 800 or so miles an hour. And then the Earth is going around the Sun at about 60,000 miles an hour. And then the Sun's going around the galaxy at around half a million miles an hour. Okay, so you're all moving very fast at the minute. You may feel relaxed, but you're not really. <laughs> These speeds are, are so f are phenomenally fast. Even so, we've only gone round our galaxy 20 times since the Sun and the planets were formed. Okay, because the sizes are so large. And when you look at a spiral galaxy like this, you can tell which way it's rotating, or at least I hope you can. The spiral arms trail the sense of direction. So if you look at that and think of it rotating, decide, is it going clockwise, anticlockwise? It's that way. And then similarly, here's one going the other way. There have, in fact, been studies done by um, one of these citizen science projects called Galaxy Zoo, where they actually look at the orientation of spirals and find whether neighboring ones, and what they find is neighboring ones tend to share a sense of direction of uh, the spin, but randomized over the whole universe, you get um, equal numbers spiraling each way. So, again, that's a very interesting study. There are, however, implications for the spin of our galaxy. Now, we measure it from, again, the red shift. If something's going away from you, it's red shift. If it's coming towards you, it's light, it's blue shifted. We can get an idea of this kind of motion, both from external galaxies, helps of their edge on, because then you've very much got that sense of rotation. But within our galaxy, we can look at the velocities of stars. We can look at star clusters. We can look at galaxy um, sorry, so gas clouds, molecular gas clouds. We can look at all the light of those, look for the blue and red shift, and we can map out their velocities. And what we build up is an idea of how fast things are moving as a function of distance out from the center. And that allows us to weigh the galaxy. Again, just returning to the idea of how far you weigh away where you are from mass and how big that mass is dictates how fast you are moving around it. You can apply it to the whole galaxy. So if you measure the rate of rotation at different distances from the center out to the outside, you can always be sensitive to how much, say you've got a star here, if that's in this galaxy, how fast that's moving around depends on how much mass it's, um, it's responding to, its gravity, um, so the gravity of that mass is what it's responding to. And you can plot this out for other spiral galaxies. You can plot it out for our own spiral galaxy. And when you do that, you get a surprise. Okay. have to show you a graph. One graph is obligatory every Gresham lecture. Okay. <laughs> so just so you know you've done some science. So what we're plotting here is distance out from centre and some very arbitrary astronomical units. Basically, this is the edge of the galaxy. This is the centre of the galaxy. And this is the speed, the rotation, you know, the speed of rotation of objects, you know, whether they're stars, galaxies, cl um, stars, clouds, or clusters of stars moving around. And this is what you'd expect. If you look at a spiral, in fact, if you look at a spiral edge on his picture of ours, you can see there's a big ball of stars, obvious big ball of stars in the middle. You'd expect a big surge in terms of the increase of velocity. And then as you move further and further away, there's less and less mass. You're getting further away from it. You're moving slower, slower, and slower. And this is what you'd expect. And this is our sun. What we actually observe is that everything is moving too fast. In particular, so the red line is the observations. Our sun, we're moving 70 kilometers per second too fast. Right at the edges of the galaxy, those stars are moving so fast, they should have been shot out into outer space. 
They shouldn't remain attached to our galaxy. If we count up all the mass we see in all the stars in the galaxy, in the bulge of our galaxy, there's not enough stuff there to provide enough gravity to keep those stars attached to our galaxy. And this is one of the key observations for the evidence of dark matter, just the rotation rate of these stars and these materials in the galaxy, our galaxy and others. It means that these stars are traveling too fast. There's more gravity they're responding to. That means there's a whole lot of stuff there that we can't see. If we add up all the light from the stars, the gas clouds, in all wave bands, there is still nowhere near enough ma mass by about a factor of 10 to provide the gravity to provide these motions. So just from observing the rotational motions of stars in our galaxy, we deduce that there's about nine-tenths of the galaxy we can't see. And in particular, it's not all associated with where the matter is. When you do the analysis properly around many spiral galaxies, including our own, if this is an edge-on view of our galaxy, we found the dark matter that we need has to be distributed around an almost a sort of flattened spherical halo way outside the main body of the galaxy. And so only from the observations do we begin to detect there's nine-tenths of a galaxy that we can't see, but nonetheless, its gravity is what we can feel. Now, at that tantalizing joint, I'm going to actually leave you because if you are really dedicated, you will come along next month. <laughs> <laughs> and in my next talk, it's going to be about clusters of galaxies, which is where we start to investigate and we pick up this idea of dark matter and we run with it for, you know, much of the talk. So thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.